Great. Well, hi, everyone. Good evening. And thank you so much for joining our live virtual event this evening. I'm your host, China, a bookseller here at Country Bookshelf. And we are grateful to be here in this virtual space with our fellow Books in Common Northwest stores, Paulina Springbrooks in Sisters, Oregon, and Madison Books in Seattle, Washington. Visit www.booksincommonnw for more information and follow us on Eventbrite to register for more great Books in Common events. Before we get to Stephen and Michael, we just wanted to point out a few things about this virtual space. Your, excuse me, your ticket to join us this evening includes a signed copy of the Meat Eater Guide to Wilderness Skills and Survival. The books will be shipped to you over the next few days. We're also recording this event and it will be viewable at a later date on the Books in Common Northwest YouTube channel after the event concludes. If you have any questions for Stephen and Michael, submit them by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen or drop them in the chat and they'll get to them as time allows. If you run into any tech issues along the way, we recommend you first try exiting and re-entering the meeting. We also recommend trying headphones to fix any sound issues. We would like to remind you that this is a shared creative space that we want to remain safe for everyone and ask that you be respectful of everyone who has joined us tonight. Offensive or inappropriate comments or questions will see the user dismissed from this space. Now I'd like to introduce Stephen and Michael. Stephen Ranella is an outdoorsman, writer, wild foods enthusiast, and television and podcast host who is passionate advocate for conservation and the protection of public lands. The host of the Meat Eater podcast and Netflix original series, he is also the author of the Meat Eater Fish and Game Cookbook, Recipes and Techniques for Every Hunter and Angler, two volumes of the complete guide to hunting, butchering, and cooking wild game, Meat Eater Adventures from the Life of an American Hunter, American Buffalo, in Search of a Lost Icon, and The Scavenger's Guide to Haute Cuisine. Michael Punk lives with his family in Montana. Punk is the history correspondent for Montana Quarterly Magazine and is the author of a novel, The Revenant. He is also the author of a work of nonfiction, Fire and Brimstone, The North Butte Mining Disaster of 1917, a finalist for the Mountains and Plains Booksellers Award. We wish to acknowledge that we are currently occupying the ancestral and ceded land of the Absaloki Crow, the Salish Kootenai, Cheyenne, Shoshone Bannock, and Ochetti Shakoan peoples. We encourage those of you joining us from outside Bozeman in Montana to learn more about the land you occupy and the story of its peoples. And with that, I'll let Michael and Stephen get to it. Thank you. Thanks, China. Hey, Stephen, how are you tonight? Good, how are you doing? And uh, yeah, thank you as well to China. And thanks for the bookstore is putting this event on and, and making the best of a, of a ongoing kind of nasty pandemic situation. So this is great. Yeah, it's uh, all these things feel a little weird, but I think we've all adapted to and gotten used to this format. So I think it, I think it's going to work well, but uh, listen, congrats on the, on the new book. Is this, I'm a little confused. Is this book six? Um, man, I have to sit and add them up for a minute. No, this, book book, this book seven. Okay. Well, I didn't want to, I didn't want to shortchange you, but, uh, I've been having a lot of fun seven. reading it. I'm very excited to dive in tonight. You know, um, uh, it would, be, it, it would be book six, but we, uh, we did a book that was too, they told us it was way too long and we either have to get rid of <laughs> half of it or cut it into two. And that's why we have a, a book set that's volume one and volume two. So it's like kind of, it, it's accidentally seven, should be six. Hey, I'm, I'm gonna give you full credit in any event. So uh, listen, I know people probably feel pretty familiar with you between your podcast and your, your TV show and the, the books that you've written. But I'm curious about a little bit of your personal backstory, uh, especially your, uh, your boyhood and things from your boyhood that might have influenced your interest in going outdoors and, and maybe even some of your early incidents with, with wilderness survival type situations. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I, we grew up like a very close relationship with nature. Uh, we wouldn't have described it that way at the time. We would have said that we, you know, like to hunt and fish. 
uh, as many people in our area did. My dad was a very avid outdoorsman. He had fought in World War II and uh, came home and, and like of so many veterans, came home and just couldn't be penned up, man. You know, like, like had a terrible wander lost, liked to get around, liked to spend time outside. He kind of came from that era, like that sort of, I always regarded like the L.L. Bean kind of camping era where you'd go with this massive footprint, you know, like lashing benches together and pine bow beds and, you know, and all those sorts of things were like the number one tool, like guys would go camping and bring a lot of axes, you know, <laughs> and just do things that were like the setup was so involved to go camping. Then you come home and it'd take days to unpack. And it's funny because later we adopted very uh, lightweight mountaineering equipment, you know, and just you kind of sit in the dirt and eat and have a cook stove that you could almost carry around in your pocket. And I looked back at that, that time as a kid and like that kind of like weird style of like siege type camping. Uh, it, it definitely informed my perspective on stuff. But yeah, we ate, ate a lot of wild game. Um, it was very celebratory around wild game like my dad recognized it as a thing that brought people together um we had a lot of wild game parties and salmon boils and it was like when you brought something home that was good to eat it was like cool you know it was it was celebrated and made people happy and it was like an accomplishment right and, and that's something i kept with me for a long time do you remember the first time you sort of went into a wild place on your own where you weren't with your dad and you, you kind of had that extra sense of, of uh, having to kind of make it without anybody else helping you out. Yeah, I don't know. You know, to say a wild place is so relative, right? Uh, you know, I've, I actually was fortunate years ago to visit a place on the north slope of the Brooks Range, which is people have sort of mathematically arrived at the idea that it's the most remote place on the continent, right? Um, so I saw like what the most remote place is like. It's so remote you can't you get you can't get a helicopter there because the helicopter would run out of gas, right? Um, but growing up in West Michigan, there were like places that, relative to my experience, felt remote. And I got really into trapping muskrats and stuff when when I was young, and did it for a long time, and did it very. I was diehard about it. So I, I did spend a lot of time out by myself doing that. And when you're running a trap line, like you, you do it every day. So I would start after some, you know, I'd start after land like fox and raccoon in mid October and I'd keep at it into February. And so at some, like, so some portion during that time, there were very few days I didn't have stuff out. Like I would spend some chunk, whether it's in the dark after school or whatever, like out by myself in an area that no one, no one from the West would look and be like, that's a wild setting, you know, because off in the distance, you're going to see a light from a house or you're going to hear a car. But it, like, it felt like that, you know, and you're dealing with the ice, um, spent an enormous amount of time on the ice. I've fallen through the ice so many times, um, creek crossings, right? You're dealing with machetes and stuff. And so it, it was on my mind. And then all, as well, I was a ravenous reader as a kid and liked to read accounts of trappers and frontiersmen and I wanted to mimic them you know um even that idea to be a trapper was heavily motivated by nostalgia when did you decide to write this book uh, uh obviously you spent a lot of time in in settings where uh the topics in this book are are at the forefront when did you decide that that you should write it up yeah that, that's a good question i think there's two two things that were at play the first book the first books i did the first three books i did were all narrative like what we'd call in the biz you know we'd call it narrative nonfiction. so like telling a true story right and those stories I told were like very centered on me and were kind of centered on my journey of discovery or like some kind of exploration of a subject, right? And you take readers along with you as you found something out. And as a journalist and as that kind of writer, you're, you're, you're sort of putting yourself in a position where 
you're, you're coming out and saying like, I'm going to go find out about a bunch of stuff and tell you about what I learned and how I learned it. Uh, I, I haven't drifted away from that wholly. Like I'll do more books like that in the future, more narrative books, more stories. But I just hit a point where through, especially through my occupation and the people I've been exposed to, I hit a point where I knew that I held an enormous amount of information in my head, both my own things and things I picked up from hanging out with people who are more skilled than I am or, you know, have more focused areas of expertise than I have. And I want to be like accumulating this big body of knowledge. And I kind of wanted to switch gears for a while, like I did with the cookbook and like I did with this and just kind of like explain how to do things to people like, and don't worry about crafting it into a narrative, but just like try to pack as much information as possible into some things and lay it all out. The second piece of the puzzle though, when I, when I said it's a little bit complicated, I think in recent decades, um, through, particularly through reality television, I feel that the whole idea of survival has been corrupted and distorted into some kind of fantasy land, you know, competitive fantasy stuff. It pushes this idea that wilderness is something that should be, you need to run away from. There was this very popular survival show for years. And it was like, the whole point was like, the guy is stuck in the woods. Everyone knows that it's horrible to be in the woods and so very dangerous. And the show was like, how do you get out of the woods as quick as possible, right? Um, I always felt more like I wanted to run to it, not run away from it. So I wanted to write something that kind of captured that sentiment of um, it's not like a scary, dangerous place. It's a place you can deal with with some basic skills and be really comfortable and have like a certain swagger um, out on the landscape in those places that are even, you know, the wildest places and have a level of comfort. And that comfort comes from developing the right mindset, the right skill set and the right toolkit. So I so, want to lay that all out. I think that really comes through as as why you're writing it. And I like I like your discussion of this not being a book to kind of help prep people for the zombie apocalypse, uh, but rather a way of giving people confidence so that they can go see something that that you've seen and that's been important to you and that you've experienced. And I, I thought that was a, an interesting aspect of this. Um, I want to drill down a little bit though on the survival concept because there is something just so evocative about the whole concept of of survival that makes it just instantly interesting and how much uh, uh, you talked about the shows where uh and i i think of the shows like where it like the show survivor where it's a, a literally a game and they do different you know uh, races to to win food and there's just a huge amount of kind of artificiality built into this Thing that actually is pretty interesting all by itself but how much have we kind of lost over the over the generations of survival skills that our forefathers would have uh you know not thought twice about uh how to build a fire and how is that how, how does that change us as a people to not have those skills anymore yeah we've lost a tremendous amount man like here's a way to visualize Here's one way to visualize some of what we lost. You imagine someone like, like I'm a great, you know, I'm sort of a student of Daniel Boone, right? Like, like I've read everything you can read about him. Um, one of the reasons I'm drawn to him is kind of, you know, his biography. He was a professional hunter, professional trapper. Um, he would go out on what they would call long hunts. He'd be gone a couple of years sometimes on a, on a hunting trip, most of it by himself. Uh, also, we just know a lot about him. You know, he sat with biographers, right? His children that he that he raised wrote about him. So we, there's a lot we know. There's not like all these mysteries. Like, for instance, when you dealt with Hugh Glass, when you did The Revenant, right? Um, there's a couple of things people know. Um, not much. But for the most part, it's like, yeah, for the most part, it's like just little snippets and clues and stuff, right? right. But here's this person, you can, get, you can get to know him really well. Like, you can get to know Boone well. And that's kind of what makes reading about Boone fun. Um, you can kind of find out where he was all the time, right? But here's this guy that compared to the Native Americans upon whose land he was hunting and basically, you know, stealing their resources, knowingly stealing their resources. Here's this guy that had a very sophisticated toolkit, right? 
he had a rifle. Um, he had flint and steel. He had uh, horses. Okay. So all these things at the time would have been regarded as cutting edge. And to the people whose land he was going on, they would have regarded him as like this, like, you know, a, a spaceman with the stuff this guy shows up with, right? But he knew how to uh, make his own gunpowder using going to a cave and getting out bat guano, wet, wetting the stuff with his own piss, using willow ash, which he preferred over other kind of wood ash, using phosphate that he got from deposits in the soil, and would concoct functional gunpowder that he would use to hunt. Everything he did, he did without a flashlight. So at night, when it got dark and you, he, he heard something, it just had to be left to your imagination. There was no shining over there to see what it was. <laughs> he that's, a great, would, that's a great example. He would, he would go hunt bears and kill bears, go to a salt lick and boil water down in order to get salt, tap maples to get maple syrup, render that down to sugar, make a salt sugar brine, brine the bear meat, build a boat, float it along the Ohio, and then sell his meat in villages um we've lost a lot i mean that's some incredible stuff it's kind of like incredible. it doesn't really matter it doesn't really matter because you don't need to go do that but i wonder like and i wondered ever since i was a little kid like how do they pull that off but here's the thing like sort of a, a way that i look at this material boone wouldn't have thought boone wouldn't have articulated to you that he was interested in survival boone would have articulated to you that He's going into the woods because he's doing something. He's going there to make a living. He had kids. He had to make money. He would say that, oh, no, I go in the woods to get done what I want to get done, and I use this skill set to do it. And it's kind of like how I view it, right? Like, I spend a lot of time out and off, often with an objective, either like an objective because we're going hunting for something, an objective because we're trying to film something, an objective because I'm working on a piece of reporting in a remote area. And, like, I want to get done what I need to get done. Um, and I want the skill set that like lets me plow through and do it and, and remain focused. It's not like doing it for the fun of doing it. You're not like doing like survival stuff because survival stuff is fun. You're doing it because you're just trying to be effective and achieve your goals. So uh, we're going to go from the sublime to the ridiculous and, and back and forth without a lot of uh, uh, linearity uh, necessarily. And I, I consider that stuff to be kind of at the philosophical end of the spectrum. And I want to come back to some of that later on. But I also want to hit some of the just fun stuff that is, is in this book. And it was, it was, I was amazed at, at how many different topics that you cover uh, and the depth at which you cover them. Everything from uh, navigation and shelter and, uh, and eating and all of that. But there, there, there are some small things along the way that, that I just want to uh, hit. Um, that, uh, uh, for example, um, you talk a lot about, about the, the dangers of, of different wild animals, but, uh, you also talk about some of the less kind of glorious, if, if I, if you, if you, if that may not be the right term, but some less glorious ways to, to end up, uh, injured or sick in the, in, in wilderness. And, some of the numbers are pretty interesting uh, in terms of where the real risk lies. And you use, for example, talk a little bit about the, the risk of, of mountain lions, uh, uh, which I would put at the glorious end of the spectrum uh, versus other things like say mosquitoes. Yeah, mountain lions, mountain lions are a great one because they, they occupy, the, they, they create like a psychological fear. It's one of those things I always talk about that's like, it's fun to be afraid of right? We love to argue, you know, what you do and how to behave when a lion comes for you. And then you, you get guys like me and they have these endless conversations about like, you better have a pistol or pepper spray. And you're talking about something that happens, being like messed up by a lion, scratched up by a lion. You're talking about something that happens every year to one or two people out of 
300 million of us. And more, w- way over half of the country um, lives in a couple hour drive of a mountain lion. It just, it's like the fact that it lives in our heads is such, it's, it's such that this like vestige of some bygone era when we needed to like be very fearful of large animals. Meanwhile, the mosquito is the world, is the deadliest animal in the world. I mean, by a factor of, I can't remember, I, I don't have the numbers yeah, at my fingertips, but you know, by a factor of tens, the deadliest animal in the world. I have come, the things that have struck me down and made me sick, put like, including surgeries and being hospitalized, has been microbes, bacteria and microbes. I had Lyme disease, um, which is a very small, back, you know, it's caused by a very tick. small bacteria that lives, on a bug, that lives on a bug so small you don't notice it on you. Uh, I've had Giardia multiple times and other kinds of waterborne pathogens, one of which landed me in the hospital for three days with a colon infection. Um, when I had Lyme disease, I had to have a surgery to have a pick line installed into my heart. Uh, cost me months of time, right? I've come to, re- like, those are the things to watch out for. Right. But we don't sit around arguing about, like, The you stories know, aren't as good. Whether you're supposed Play dead or punch back and all that, you know, because it's just not as fun to think about. But in the book, I try to really encourage people to think about the stuff that's actually going to happen to you. Hypothermia and microbes. Yeah. Well, even when it comes to animals, uh, I'm always uh, amazed every summer at the it, 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 at the number of tourists in Yellowstone who are uh, trampled by by buffalo, or I think you use the example of of moose in uh, in Fairbanks, and it's uh, that's not quite as glorious as a, as a bear attack either, if, even if you're going to get attacked by an animal. No, the, yeah, a, a, a bison is the number one, uh, you know, the number one animal to inflict injuries in Yellowstone. Uh, there, there's, I, I read about this quite a bit at one point in time, and it was that uh, getting your buttocks punctured by a horn is very common, uh, which kind of tells you what's happening in that moment. And then in Alaska, getting run over by, yeah getting run over and trampled by moose. It's just not where we expect it to come from. And I guarantee at some point in time in the next week, guaranteed, I will have a debate with people about what I'm gonna do to fight a bear off. (laughs) Well, it it does make for good stories. And and you do point out, uh, (laughs) particularly in some of the elk hunting backcountry, you know, if you elk hunt for a decade or two, you'll, a bear is one that you probably will run into. Oh, you know, but, you know, I should point out, man, I talk about this in the book, like grizzlies are no joke because you have, there's enough bears in this country where I think, uh, oh man, I think we have like, there's like bear hunting seasons in 30 some states. I think, you know, we have black, like sustainable black bear populations in 36 states, uh, some 10 million. Um, no, sorry. Tens of thousands, close to a million bears. And then you have three states that have grizzlies. Those states all have around 500,000 in Wyoming, a million in Montana, a million plus in Idaho, living around 2,000 grizzlies. And every year they kill a couple people. That's like a real, you know, that's a real thing. Uh, we talked about that a little bit. That, it, it, it's, it's legitimate to at least be scared of them. Uh, being yep. scared of black bears, just there's nothing to back it up. So uh, I want to shift topics a little bit here uh, to some of the discussion in the book about about finding food in in the wild and uh, Mm. or taking food into the wild. I want to talk about both ends of the spectrum. I want to talk, first of all, about snares. And I have to tell you that since I was a boy, I have I was or I should say it differently. When I was a boy, I was determined that I was going to build a snare that would catch something. And I, as a boy, worked at it uh, apparently not long enough because I never caught anything. Uh, I, I want to know that it, I, could, I could be successful catching something with a snare if I persevered long enough. Hand, this is something I, let me hit two points real quick. Um, in looking at the book, you'll find, at least the way we viewed it and working on it, 
you'll find that most of the chapters take you from this thing of like everything going great and what to do when everything's great. And then as things get worse, what to do. So the food chapter begins just like food lists, like how to pack for trips, <laughs> right. like what to bring and how to fit more calories and all that. And then, and as you get deeper in the book, it like it, it more is that, you know, it, it gets more like, okay, you have no food, you have no obvious way to procure food. What should you be doing with your time? Right. And so it takes right. you through this trip. Uh, you'll notice that we don't spend a lot of time on any time on building deadfalls. And, and that was my favorite part of survival <laughs> books because I love the deadfalls. The only people that can catch an animal with a deadfall are people that, root, that have the discipline to routinely train in how to do that. You, I'm just going to come out and say it. You will not, you will not glance at pictures of deadfalls in a survival book and then go and catch something <laughs> using a deadfall. It is a, even trapping with conventional equipment is a lifelong discipline. Same thing with like building, making a fire with a, with a, with a bow drill. People that make fires with bow drills can make fires with bow drills. People that don't can't. It's like you have to study it and learn it. But with snares, yes, with the right tools. That's one of the things I talk about is like with a modern conventional snare, which I have some, like I keep some in my kit. Going some places, I carry them in my kit, what we call like a survival snare, but it's the same thing that a trapper or damage control person would use, like a cable snare. Um, with a small amount of training, one can develop like a pretty high level of proficiency pretty quickly with that. Doing that would be a great way to teach you um, that it's hard to do. There's a great story. I kicked the book off by talking about this pilot named Leon Crane, who was in an experimental aircraft during World War II and crashed in Alaska. I actually had the opportunity one time when I was coming back from a caribou hunt to fly over. The wreckage of his plane is still in the mountain, still on the mountain in the Yukon Charlie's Preserve up in Alaska. We flew over the wreckage. He was with three other, four other guys. Everybody died in the crash. Leon Crane managed to get out of the plane and parachuted down, middle of the winter. Guy spent 90 some days out alone. They never came to look for him. They didn't know where to look. It, it, when he relayed his story, he landed and there were pine squirrels all around him. Okay. What you determine is the easiest thing in the world to catch. Pine squirrels all around him. He spent days trying to catch a pine squirrel. This is a person who is trained for this. Spent days trying to get catch a pine squirrel, couldn't. And then driven by like hunger and madness and frustration about not being able to catch one, started walking and ran into a trapper's cabin, busted the door down. And that's why he lived to tell the tale. He was an abandoned so cabin, right? Like, was, he, he kind of equipped himself, right? No, it was, it was, no one was there, but it was a well-stocked trapper's cabin. Right. And then he stayed there, burned up the supplies, found another one. But I always look at that and I, and I realize that like, I like to think in my mind that I'd be, able, I'd be killing pine squirrels all day long, but would you really? <laughs> and so that's part of the, that, that's kind of like part of the, the, the mindset stuff I'm talking about in the book is like, we, we kick this around once. Like you fall through the ice, okay? Which I've done a ton of times. You fall through the ice, you pop up. You're wet, it's cold. You need to really quickly in your head, you're like A, B, C. Like A, I haul ass. Um, but how far is it? Like, B, I make a fire. Can I get a fire going? C, I would, right? And, like, getting good at thinking through that stuff. And, and like, Leon Crane in that story that I tell, like, Leon Crane's like, A, I'll live off pine squirrels. And quickly he's like, nope, what's B, right? And, and B want it being right. So weighing out these scenarios and being realistic about what you can actually do. If you go through the ice and it's below zero and you're going to haul ass for five miles, probably not. So a couple of uh, desperation uh, topics I want to throw out there that you talk about in the book. Um, uh, opine for a, a bit on uh, drinking one's own urine. Yeah, that's one of our favorite subjects with the guys I work with. Uh, it, it's funny because it's, um, it's, it's such a stable of, you know, it's such a state, not stable, it's such a staple of, a certain genre of television but it uh it does you no good um it does not hydrate you it would be similar to being stranded on the ocean and drinking ocean water and if you recycle it and do it a couple times 
uh, it's actually damaging you rather than doing you any, you know, it's damaging you rather than doing nothing, which is what happens when you initially drink your own urine. Uh, there's so many tropes that are so bullshitty that are out there. We don't really take the time to address all of them, but some of them are so pervasive that we do get into some of these things like um, sucking venom, okay? Out of sucking snake bite venom out. Sort of like why that's not really a thing. Um, well, I remember when I was a boy, pee. when I was a boy, we used to carry these snake bite kits that had the little suction cups and they, we like bought them because we thought that's what we were supposed to, to carry in snake country. So uh, yeah. you're, you're going to advise against the, uh, the snake bite kit suctioning of rattlesnake poison? The, the conventional, like the, the, the understanding now, the academic consensus on this now is that that stuff moves very fast. It's highly soluble. By the time you get in there, it's long gone. You're not going to get it out. What you're going to do is potentially cause cut, infection. Cut, cut yourself. <laughs> cause infection and bleeding to no gain. Likewise with, you know, you know, a big movie we all liked when we were kids, the Rambo movies. Likewise with like the, the cowboy movie staple, the Rambo staple of uh, cauterizing wounds. Um, pulling knives and bullets out of you like so there's some of the stuff that's just like kind of so funny because it pops up in movies so much that we do take a little time for a little levity here and there and um and, and talk yeah, about where these ideas came from and why they need to go and die okay well speaking of levity uh and maybe this is your idea of a sense of humor or something i'm not sure but uh I did want to give you an opportunity to, to talk for a while about the topic of 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 cannibalism yeah, that's my favorite. Uh, which you, <laughs> you you address with its own subheading. I notice. It uh, yeah. I, I think that we end the food. Remember, I was saying like the chapters go <laughs> right, good to worse. So the food chapter again begins with like, what's a you know day hike pack ride, back country pack and list right, and then it ends with it ends with sourcing food and how rolling over rotten logs is more effective way to get food than trying to deadfall deer but uh it ends with a, a i think it's called like and lastly a thought or two on cannibalism and uh i acknowledge in there and no one really knows no one really knows i acknowledge in there that the people i hang out with anyone i would choose to be in a situation with that might lead to someone needing to do some cannibalism would probably prefer that they be cannibalized if that meant that their friends would get to make it and i don't know but i speculate that i would probably find it in me in a situation and we talk about well, you know very briefly i talk about uh some of the thoughts and considerations that go into this and then we offer up you know a little bit tongue-in-cheek but we offer up some suggestions a recipe what, yeah the cuts you, you what, offer a recipe <laughs> what cuts you might be interested in <laughs> well i I, I thought that uh that part that part uh was gripping i have to say so uh um but uh, uh it had it had to be mentioned and i think that that you know the um is it donner bonner what was that you, you're you're an expert on this area was it bonner or donner the donner party donner the donner party so you have the alive you have the alive story of the the yeah. athletes the, Donner, the soccer team, um, various Arctic explorations, right? It's just a, it's it's yeah. a thing that comes up, and I felt it had to be addressed. I think it had to be addressed. I'm not sure you came down on the right right spot, but at, at least you were you were all in, and you, you proved you were all in when you included the recipe at the end. So, uh, if people go a certain direction, it's 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 all right there. It, it is a, it is an interesting uh, question about uh, friendship, though. Uh, if that's a test of true friend. Um, and sure. I, I noticed you kind of set that up too. So uh, again, from the sublime to the, uh, to the, to the, uh, to the ridiculous here. Um, a couple of other miscellaneous questions here. Uh, I love the idea of the caveman cooking and the boiling water in, in, uh, in a pit lined with an animal's skin or animal stomach. And I've 
read historic accounts of that and always thought it sounded cool. But have you have you done that? It works like I we were stunned. What, I was tell what stunned. give a little bit of a description about how this works, first of all. Well, yeah, I want I want to tell you first how it how it came to my attention. Um when I was working on my Buffalo book, I was spending a lot of time with anthropologists who and I kind of went down a bit of a rabbit hole. Like I did way more research and made it into the book, but I spent a lot of time with anthropologists who dealt with ice age hunters and, and how ice age hunters did what they did. And um, there was evidence to suggest it, that they would use in other cultures as well, but they would line, they would dig a pit and line it with a, with a Buffalo hide. And then you, they would sometimes find the, 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 the evidence of this left behind. You'd, you'd line a pit with a Buffalo hide and then use that to uh, cook and extract marrow and use it to render fat. So to get tallow off game meat and stuff. Um, and I got curious about that. And so when I, when I first did it, I took a, the stomach of a javelina and washed out the stomach of a javelina and dug a little head sized hole. And I used tent stakes, but I basically pinned the rim of that stomach so it was like the lip of a cauldron. And then I got a fire going and just started heating rocks up. Well, then I filled the stomach full of water. Sorry. So I got a stomach full of water in the head sized hole and I pinned the um, take tent stakes, but you can use wooden pegs. Right. Like, in the lip of the stomach, they opened up stomach around the hole. We laughed because it looked like that uh, Sarlacc, Sarlacc pit from Star Wars. Like <laughs> Boba Fett. Boba Fett falls in. It looked kind of like yeah. that. And then right. heated rocks on a fire, man. And I was like, I couldn't figure out how long it's going to take. I'm not kidding you, man. We dropped two, three of those rocks in there. Um, You know, fist-sized rocks. And yeah. that water started to boil and just dropped meat in there and cooked it like that. And I've since done with a handful of things, hides, stomachs. It works surprisingly well. And uh, the thing I haven't seen, though, is I I was in South America with traveling with Amerindians once and they would cook meat inside turtle shells. But other than that, I haven't seen any like contemporary group use that method but other methods we talk in there in our caveman cooking thing was basically like you read accounts of this all the time like lewis clark described it many people describe it they would take small animals and just throw the small animal in the fire and burn the hair off and let it cook in their skin i've done that with rabbits and squirrels and i was in vietnam one time and a guy had killed a marsupial up in a tree with an air gun and a farmer and he cooked the exact same way. And it was like, you're watching someone cook something the way people have cooked for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. He threw it in a fire and stirred it around with a stick. The hair all burned off. The skin kind of got leathery. And then that thing steamed inside of its own hide. Um, and then he just kind of peel it. off the black stuff. And you know, he took a machete and cut it up. And he basically ate it out of the shell of the burned up skin. Uh -huh. uh, Francis Parkman in his book, Oregon Trail, talks about coming into a Sioux camp and they thumped the puppy on the head, put the puppy in, burned its hair off. Uh, very common, man. You don't see anybody cook anything like that anymore. Um, um, but it works. I, I, I test it out, you know. What's the, uh, what's the most desperate thing that you've, uh, you've eaten in, in the wild? Out of desperation, not just curiosity, but desperation. Yeah, so I'm going to put two kinds of desperation. Um, one is desperation, like in a social situation. And again, and I, I, I mentioned it, I talk about this all the time. I got like mentionitis about it, but maybe I'm traumatized. Eating monkey, eating monkey meat, um, especially because the monkey was just cooked you know it looked like it could have i mean it looked like it was going to get up and walk away but it was like not disjointed you know so you're like eating on a monkey that's like a monkey a cooked monkey um and that was not like desperation but it was, it was being with people it was a favorite food of theirs it just wasn't like something you'd back out of and i'm not the kind of guy that would have backed out of it anyway but it was a moment for sure that i took note of 
It sounds uh, like a. Ga- it, sounds like a it sounds like a gateway drug to cannibalism to me. I think once you get start with the primates, you just it's a slippery slope. I had all, and I had always said that I wouldn't do it. I had always said <laughs> that's where I would draw the line. I wouldn't eat a monkey. But out of desperation, one time we were on. I was on a trip with my brothers. We ran out of food, and, and I, t- I, I mentioned this in the book too because we ran out of food so much up in Alaska that we were taking a. Uh, like, you know what a hall, like a hall, remember halls, I don't know if still make those things, like halls, methyl yeah, lipids, like yeah, yeah, lozenges, yeah. Oh, yeah. cutting them up, cutting them up <laughs> to ration them up. Like, here's your third, here's your third. Anyways, we got a black bear. We eventually got a black bear on that trip and rendered its fat down. And we're frying bear meat in the fat. Mm. And we were so hungry. I remember my brother drank a coffee mug of that stuff. Like, drank a coffee mug of bear oil i got a hat on right now it says bear grease but drank a um and i remember thinking there's no way he's gonna walk away from this like without some kind of gastrointestinal (laughs) disruption but he was fine and then that's just what we started to drink you know and now i quite like it but at the time it seemed (laughs) otherworldly starbucks hasn't picked up on that one yet no, like you never would drink a cup of bacon grease, right? But if you get that hungry, <laughs> if you get that hungry, it's like, it seems like the best thing in the world. I want to shift topics to shelter for a second. Um, what's the weirdest place you ever slept? Hmm. Man, kind of like weird, like down in Mexico, you know, often like kind of like bound out a band and little structures now and then uh that we run into and those are always a little weird because it, it, it feels like someone might turn up all of a sudden under trucks and things uh i've slept inside of we used to fish this place in michigan's upper peninsula where we'd fish at a hydroelectric dam and certain turbine tunnels were more productive than others and we used to leave the bar at night and drive our boat inside the dam and tie off to a stud in the ceiling of the turbine tunnel it was warm in there from all that for you generate electricity <laughs> sleep in there in order to get the prime fishing spots uh i've slept in caves um homemade little structures just laying out i guess right nothing to really like i never like slept um you know i never slept inside of a buffalo carcass Buffalo carcass. Yeah, I haven't either. Uh, I did enjoy the part of your oh, you didn't book, do that though, about, your research? I did not. No, that was not part of my research. Uh, in fact, that was a that was a movie special. Uh, so that, that I can't oh, take any okay. credit for that one. <laughs> um, but they, they, I did. They I did. Well, it's been in like five movies. Speaking of tropes, uh, including even Star Wars. Uh, so, um, but anyway. Um, I, I love your discussion of the the utility of the lowly tarp as a as a as a shelter. I've taken to oh yeah just just the tarp on a lot of backpacking trips because it's so damn light. But talk about the tarp. <laughs> yeah, I, you know that's one of those things where it turns up in all okay it, 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 it's a, it's it turns up in all the old survival books and all the old bushcraft and woodsman books like the tarp structure it's right there with the pine bow bed and um pine bow beds are horribly uncomfortable turns out um i was always used to be kind of like dismissive of tarps because it seemed like a thing that they would have had before they had tents but man i've come you know just over the years i've become such a believer in them because they're so versatile. I rig mine out, I kind of customize mine a little bit. Like I like a eight by six or a 10 by eight tarp. And what I do is I take eight inch loops of shock cord. So eight inch loops of like three sixteenths shock cord. And in every grommet, I put one of those in. So it's got a, a wrist size loop of shock cord on uh, or a fist size loop of shock cord. You can, with that setup, it adds a little bit of weight. But with that setup, you can get it up so fast. And, and oftentimes, just even during the daytime, if you're traveling in the rain or traveling in snow and you want to stop to eat, stop to glass if you're hunting, whatever you're doing, it can just be instantly rigged up. 
where those little bungees you can wrap them around branches you can put the right. put the bungee cord on a rock and it's just a really valuable thing the only place where it really starts to fall apart is if with insects mm. with insects and then heavy snow load can be problematic unless you have a big enough tarp where you can really get a, a, a right. big pitch but they're great spend a lot a lot of nights like that and there's like a psychological thing where if you put a tarp you put up a tarp shelter and you don't have a screen for bugs and it doesn't rain then you didn't need it like it might prevent some dew and frost from getting on you which is nice and it does help for that but there's like a psychological yeah thing i think we you know, spend most nights in shelter um and it's just for whatever reason you just sleep I do. I'll admit it. I sleep better with something over my head. It's like just like a little bit of protection. Another way we rig them, we kind of explain in the book how to rig them too, where you can make a wall that you can put on the wind side. And that breeze wakes you up so much when you're just sleeping out under the stars. You, it's, it's surprising how easily moving air it is. Your body registers it as unusual. So yeah, I think yeah. they're quite valuable, man. And then they, you know, it's like a Nalgene bottle, right? The size of a good one. Yeah, they're so light. And uh, I thought there were lots of, of fun ideas for various types of, of shelters. And I, I, I love the, the, the organization that you talk about from the progression from, you know, your, your nice wall tent at, at the beginning down to what you're doing in more of a survival situation. That's an interesting way of, of looking at it. Um, well, I've got a couple more questions, but I want to pause here for a second. I can't, I'm having trouble seeing the uh, questions that might be coming in from uh, some of the, the people who are listening. I don't know if you can see those, Steve. If so, if you want yeah, to react the first to any of those. For you. The ah. first one was for you, and I'm going to, because this, this the, uh, the, the, you know, just for everyone to know, I had Michael on our podcast one time. We talked a fair bit about um, the book he wrote, The Revenant, and the movie that came out of it. And, you know, where one left off and the other picked up. And this person has a, uh, a Revenant movie question uh, okay. that I want to put to you. But I want to put to you anyway, because you, you're well-versed in this stuff. He talks about um, free, uh, Hugh Glass free-pouring black powder into his mouth and then seemingly spitting the black powder and a ball into the muzzle of his rifle to quickly load yep. it. Yep. Can you so really that, that? <laughs> that scene really bothered me uh for in terms of how he loaded his gun in the movie but what bothered me even more than that was the fact that at one of the things that was just so inaccurate is after he shoots he didn't immediately reload and uh the first thing those guys would have done after shooting is reload and this is in the opening scene when he shoots the when he shoots the elk uh and there's just a bunch of things like that that um um i guess i've heard of, of guys holding uh balls multiple balls in their in their mouth and then spitting them in I, i've not heard of I, i've not seen them do that with the powder i think there were uh there were a number of of hollywoodifications there uh which we, you and i talked about when uh i was on your show steve and that was that was uh just just part of the of the uh adventure of watching your your book and made into a movie you know there's a great sign off you know like when you're when you're saying goodbye to a friend you do the old mountain man sign off which is like keep your powder dry um yeah. basically have a good day right and that seems like a bad way to keep your powder dry we did have this conversation really recently way. about someone wondering if like if if black powder shooters of your if they measured their powder and why in movies are they always free pouring and a, and a historian wrote in and explaining that free pouring was almost certainly um a thing and he brought up an interesting point that the the, the black powder wasn't standardized like remember earlier i mentioned daniel boone uh making his own gunpowder making his own gunpowder there were hot powder. there were like hot powders <laughs> slow powders he said it was more art than science and every batch was different. And so it was just a constant tinkering. And so he's like free pouring powder, not out of the question. Um, no. Someone asked, 
with ice season coming up, what do you look for in tasks when getting out on the ice? Uh, man, you know, I have like, a, I feel, because I grew up in Michigan and we play a lot of pond hockey and we trapped a lot through the ice and we ice fished a lot through the ice. So I feel like if I had one thing, like if I was, if I had to put my name in to get an honorary PhD for something, it would be like, walking on bad ice i feel like i should like i deserve recognition for walking on bad ice and i it's almost hard i, I try to explain as best i can in the book but it's it's like you're seeing things that are a little bit hard to get but one thing i'll tell people is when you're watching a movie say like never cry wolf or something and someone falls through the ice for one minute they're walking along and then all of a sudden bam they're through the ice. It never, ever happens that way. It starts to sag. Water starts to come up through cracks. It starts to do weird stuff. Like, you always know. You generally always are like, man, I'm going to fall through the ice, you know? And, it, and it's like, <laughs> it goes like that. We try to really put it into, try to put it into numbers. And I'm like, and we talked about how to assess good ice and bad ice, right? Like we used to call it black ice, but it didn't have, it had fewer bubbles in it, right? When you, when you, when you get an ice cube out of your fridge and you hold that, if you get an ice cube out of your fridge and you hold it up to the light, you'll notice that the bottom, what was the bottom half of the ice cube when it was in an ice cube tray, the bottom half of that ice cube is going to be good ice. It's going to look like black ice. The top half is going to get whiter and whiter and whiter as you go up. There's just more bubbles in it. That's poor ice. Um, we talk about some of that stuff, how to gauge it. If you got three inches of good, like clear-ish ice, you are, that's safe. But we also point out that, and I've done, I was doing this the other day. You could be standing on five inches of ice and reach over and dip your hand into the water. If you have current, beaver runs, muskrat runs, um, a lot of decaying vegetation puts off, it creates heat as it decomposes that destroys ice. So this is all kind of stuff we get into and explain in, uh, and explain in ice walking. So it's a good question, complicated answer. Um, let me look here. Oh, someone asked like when contracting, when I contracted Giardia, Basically saying, like, did you kind of know the risk? Yes, we actually, the time that I got real sick and wound up being hospitalized from complications that came out of it, we joked and laughed about how I was going to get it because we, we were in Arizona, had a run out of water. We got down into a canyon bottom and very thirsty. And I was with a few guys that I worked with, and everybody did iodine tablets. And then, then I... You get to sit there 20 minutes. And I crushed my iodine tablets up with a leather man and shook it up. And then I said, you know, what are the chances? And we all had a laugh. And I, uh, man, did I get sick. So, yeah, really knew it. The first time I ever got it, it caught me totally by surprise. Um, it was right where I grew up. I was drinking water out of a creek, kind of wondering, like, why don't people just drink water out of creeks? And got sicker in hell. Um, but later, it lasts a yeah, while too, known... right? Doesn't Giardia? It's not one that's like a twenty-four hour flu. Doesn't that stick with you for a while? No, it hits you later enough that it's hard to put together what happened unless you go get tested. And then it comes and goes in a really vicious way. It's like you think you got better for a day, it comes back. Um, you eat, and all of a sudden you feel sick. It's just, it's such a bad thing. And you get these like really, really weird like belches that are just hard to live with. And yeah, and if you don't get it treated, it can go on for weeks. Um, it's kind of miserable. Oh, I'm trying to think if we want to grab no more. We'll check the time too. I want to I want to jump back in at some point, Steve. So tell me when. Please go ahead. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use one eye to look at some of these. Sure. So I Go want to ahead. ask you just a, a little bit about uh, about your writing process, and you mm -hmm. you downplayed a little bit the 
this book in terms of saying it's more scattershot and a kind of a, you didn't try to pull out any grand themes, but I actually thought it was one of the fun things about this is you do, you manage to weave in a lot of interesting uh, broader themes, even while you're talking about some very practical information on a whole range of, of topics. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't sell yourself short in terms of uh, those types of things that, that come through here. Um, and I think it's important uh, and impressive, actually, the, the praise that you've received over the years uh, for, your, for your writing. Uh, 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 I, this, I think the reviews are just starting to come out of, the, of this new book. I know there was a, a fun profile piece in the, in the Wall Street Journal today, but one of your last, one of your earlier books was described by the New York Times uh, as uh, as th the genuine passion humbly conveyed is when nonfiction slaughters fiction uh, and hangs it over the mantle. I thought that was a great a great uh, review to have from the New York Times because I suspect that the New York Times was probably looking for a reason not to like your book and you didn't let them do that. So I, I admired that. And then the Wall Street Journal talked about your prose being so engrossing, so riveting that it matches punch for punch uh, the best sports writing. So uh, I think that there's a lot of very serious writing in here. I hope you don't mind, but I wanna read one little uh, sentence or two sentences that really stuck with me and just ask you to kind of reflect on that in terms of a, of a broader theme for the book. And it's from the end of your introduction. It's not from the end of the book, but it is from the end of the int introduction. And you say, uh, and remember always that the natural world is sacred and deserves our love and respect. To touch nature is to touch the hand of God. This book is not about running away from the wild. It's about running into her arms headlong and with an open heart. That's a pretty interesting uh, theme to kind of, and, and it really does come through not just in the introduction, but throughout. And I just wonder if you wanna uh, opine on that a little bit more before we end up. Yeah, I'd love to. And it's, I think I alluded to it earlier about not running away from nature or the wilderness, but, but running toward it is because I don't, um, I never have a sense that there's anything menacing about, um, menacing about nature, menacing about animals, menacing about wilderness. I think that it's easy, especially in the, the world I occupy a little bit with, with hunting and fishing, things that people might have traditionally, you know, written off as the blood sports. Um, some of the reputation that guys like me have gotten isn't completely undeserved. Uh, we use a lot of things like conquer it and, and conquer the wild and, you know, take ahead of game, right? And, and there's this sort of like way in which we talk about or view nature it's where you're 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 dominating it you're overcoming it it's man versus wild right not man in collaboration with wild but like it's adversarial um and maybe at a time in my life i might have just reflexively just because i heard it maybe i would have art articulated it back some way like that that you were overcoming it or doing something um the older I get and the more experience I have, the more I, I, I view that it done best. It's like walking in hand in hand with it. I, I think that where it gets a little bit tricky for me though, is a, a lot of people who are kind of my, my intellectual adversaries, so to speak, push this idea that nature is, um, that we're completely outside of it. And that it's sort of the national park model, that they feel that nature is something that you look at through a windshield. And that the minute you play in its space and become a participant in it, um, you're doing something wrong, right? That, that we're so corrupted and so ugly that they just don't like any man-made influence. To kind of get a little bit of what I'm talking about, there's this Instagram, page I like a lot called nature is metal and the guy that does the page isn't guilty of this but his audience is where nature is metal is just like 
sort of horrific nature scenes, okay? So a lion decapitating a, um, a gazelle, right? There's nothing that's too bloody and outrageous that just gets like cheered. It's it just showing like the brutality of nature, the, br the brutality of animal on animal death and violence. And people revel in it, they celebrate it. The minute there's any inkling of a man, of a human playing in that space, that person becomes pounced on as like the evilest thing in the world. And we've developed this mindset with, with, with civilization that we're like kind of like too dirty and too impure to dare be part of nature. Um, I don't feel that way. I believe in having, I don't, I don't necessarily, I'm not like prescribing this to people that don't want it, but personally, I believe in having a very hands-on relationship with nature and the natural world. Um, if you're going to do that, you need to figure out how to do it responsibly. And you need to figure out a way that you could argue successfully at the end of your life that you left it better than you found it, but it's okay to play within it. Um, and, and so that's, uh, I, I would like to think that, that if someone looked at the body of work I've done, television, you know, podcasting, books, whatever, that that would be a, a, a theme that, that, that w would be obvious to someone who was looking carefully. Well, I think it, it does come through in a, in a really clear way. And I think you make a, a very persuasive uh, case for why that's uh, an appropriate way for, for people to go into to wilderness. So I don't, uh, I know I can't wrap it up any better than that. And uh, unless you want to, Steve, I will, I will say, uh, say thanks for uh, sharing the, your stories tonight and uh, for writing this new book. I think it's one that, that will achieve your purpose, which is giving a lot of people uh, the confidence to, to go into the, the wild and, and to experience that in a, in a way that, that will enrich their lives. So, so thanks for that. Yeah, thank you. And uh, I owe you one. When your next book is ready to go, I'll, I'll, I don't know, I'll walk through flames to help you out. So let, let me know what I, let me know what I can do. Hey, hey, thanks for that. Uh, thanks, Stephen. Yep. Thanks, thanks everyone. Uh, in, enjoyed it. Yep. Thanks Take everyone care. for joining.